The best way to know who your dream prospects are is to look at your history. And I know when I did this exercise for my organization, Tony Morris International, I had, I had 212 clients. And Brad explained that you break them down into four grades, A to D. And A were like your dream customers, right? They either, they were your most profitable or they're the ones you just love to work with. B's were your bread and butter. These were ones that most repeat purchases, but not big profit. C were your one-off clients and D were your dead. These were the ones who pay you the least, but give you the biggest headache. This is Outside Sales Talk, the best podcast for outside salespeople. I'm your host, Steve Benson. And we're here to chat with the world's top sales experts so that you can get their best sales tactics to level up your game. Welcome back to Outside Sales Talk. Today, I've got Tony Morris with us, and we're going to talk about highly effective sales prospecting skills. So um, just by way of introduction, Tony is a sales expert and motivational speaker. He has helped over 26,000 sales professionals for the last 21 years and has discovered the common traits of the top 1% of sales professionals that will help your team sell more, more often, and with ease. So, uh, Tony, it's great to have you on the show here. No, thank you for having me. Really looking forward to it. So just to jump right into the first question, uh, how, how can salespeople build a mindset for effective prospecting? So build an effective, a mindset for effective prospecting. I think the mindset's got to be, they have to believe and genuinely believe that they can help. They can add value. And by adding value, that might be help their prospects solve problems, solve pain, solve challenges, or help them achieve the, the prospects goals or aspirations. Um, and I've, you know, I've been in sales for, as you, as you said in the introduction, for 20, 22 years now. And I, I genuinely do feel and know that I help my clients in, in uh, accommodate both those things, be it solve problems or achieve aspirations. So I think if, if you go into every prospecting call or meeting with that mindset and that belief that you are there as a problem solver, um, I believe that's the right frame of mind to have the success and the outcomes that you deserve. And what specific strategies do outside salespeople need to apply to find the best prospects and drive revenue? Yeah, that's a good, that's a really good question. And I think that's something that most field sales reps, in my experience, struggle with. Who are the right prospects for them? And, and I learned this many years ago um, by a gentleman, Australian entrepreneur called Brad Sugars, who is the founder of Action Coach, one of the biggest coaching franchises, I think the biggest coaching franchise in the world. And what, what he explained is the best way to know who your dream prospects are is to look at your history. And I know when I did this exercise for my organization, Tony Morris International, I had, I had 212 clients. And Brad explained that you break them down into four grades, A to D. And A were like your dream customers, right? They either, they were your most profitable or they're the ones you just love to work with. B's were your bread and butter. These were ones that most repeat purchases, but not big profit. C were your one-off clients and D were your dead. These were the ones who pay you the least, but give you the biggest headache. And we've all got those, right? So reactively, you're going to get A's to D's. But proactively, when you're prospecting, you want to only go for your A's. And when you understand who they are, choose your lane and start to really go after the competitors of all your grade A clients when it comes to prospecting, because they're the ones really you want to attract into your pipeline. Yeah, identifying, I guess, what I've heard called a lot, the ideal customer profile and really... <laughs> staying laser focused on that when you're on your outbound side can really help the whole organization because you're, you're getting the best customers who are the highest profit, who take the least amount of work and that value flows through the whole system. 
They're, Correct. E they're easier to market to. They're easier. The, sh the sales cycle is shorter. They're, they, they're willing to pay more. They're, they're easier to maintain and take care of going forward. Absolutely. They, they reorder consistently. So it's just going after, and I, I love that thought about, you know, identifying the competitors of the people that are already using your product is, is just a fantastic mm. one. Mm. Um, can you give a specific example and walk us through the prospecting process as you see it from research to the initial yeah. contact? Yeah, I, I think this has changed. So probably 14 years ago when I set up my company, prospecting activity was pick up the phone, make a cold call. Um, and, and that just doesn't have the same level of success now. So there's a couple of things that I suggest with prospecting activities. So one is, what's your trigger event? So I use Google Alerts. Some people use LinkedIn. They're both great. So when I've identified, I call them my hit lists. So I always choose my top 50 and they normally are the grade A competitors. And I have a Google alert set up for all of them so that constantly on a daily basis, I get emails sent to me about those companies, whether they've, they've, they've started a new product line or they've just appointed a new director or they've won an award or they've merged or acquired a business. So, that to me is a trigger point, so I can then make reach out. So that's sort of my first bit of research, and, and I've always got a success story to talk about. So when I phone them, I'm always, always ready to not talk about what I do, but talk about what I've done successfully with people or businesses like theirs. So not only do I, I can name drop, but I can talk about what product we used and most importantly, what the results were. And then I like to use, I use a software called BombBomb. Um, there's a free version called Loom. And I like to do a video outreach so that I know the decision maker and, and maybe there's multiple stakeholders, but I know who's involved in that process normally from my research. And I'll send them a video. And I literally hold up this little whiteboard with a, it's a speech bubble whiteboard that I got on Amazon for a fiver that says, hi, Ben. So you're, you know, hi, John, hi, Steve. So they're going to open the email and you know, they're going to play the button on the video because it's their name. And the video is just 30 seconds talking about an elevator pitch, how I've helped someone like them. And then a nice call to action at the end that I'm going to be in touch in the next couple of days to see if I can help you as well. And once I've done that and bomb bomb tells me when they've opened it and then I pick up the phone on the back of them opening the video and I make contact and that's really how I, and, and then the final piece of activity is I use sales navigator on LinkedIn and then I do a message sequence. I've got like seven messages that I write where I give away a white paper and then I, I ask a couple of questions after that. What did you think? What have you implemented? And I follow up that with a phone call. Yeah, I've seen another company, uh, Vidyard, that does something very similar, and, and we've uh, we've we've done we've tried that out a bit at Badger, um, and and Sales Navigator is one of the certainly one of the most powerful uh, Vidyard doing the same similar thing to Bomb Bomb or Loom. Yeah. Um, but really cool new technology for for uh, all of those are really cool and a new way of reaching out and doing things that really wasn't available in the past here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, what would you, uh, what would you say, how should outside salespeople approach cold calling? What are the do's and what are the don'ts there? Hmm. So I, I think the first thing to think about is the name cold calling, because if you look at that as a name cold, it means, you know, they, they're not expecting your call. You don't really know much about them. You're not well versed. You're not prepared. Um, hence the fact it's cold. So my first suggestion is don't ever do a cold call. And I, I follow an amazing American guy called Art Subcheck. I was I was on his podcast, a webinar, a few couple of months back, and and Art calls it smart calling, and I call it value calling. I believe you've got to add value to them in some way, in some degree. So another activity that I do 
um, on the back of a value call. And again, it depends on your business, right? But if I'm selling, I don't know, web design or, or web optimization, I might do a bit of a research, a, a web audit and send you an email saying that I've done a web audit. I've identified 23 areas that you could improve your website for optimization. Let's set up a call on Zoom to discuss it. So what I do in my business running a sales training company is I do a mystery call before I make any phone call. So I actually say to the director, I've made a mystery call posing as a customer and I've identified at least seven areas that I could develop your sales individual and let's set up a call to discuss it. So the first point is it's never cold. So I guess the do's are know the decision maker and know the stakeholders try and make sure you do a bit of homework go on linkedin look them up who are you connected with are you able to name drop um about someone that they're either connected with or about their previous workplaces have you read any articles they've written so you can comment on them have you been on their website so you can ask a couple of questions about it they're the do's i guess the big don't the biggest don't is don't say on a on a cold call or a value call so tell me, Steve, what is it you do at, at Badger? You're just going to get absolutely shot down because, you know, you're phoning them, right? So I think that's an absolute don't. And also don't make any assumptions. Just because they're there, they might be the MD, that doesn't, mean they're, that doesn't mean they're the decision maker. And it doesn't mean there's others involved in the decision maker process. So I think make no assumptions. And, and ask great questions, have them prepared. So don't make a call where you've not prepared at least five or six very well, well rehearsed questions that's gonna to get to the pain points quickly. Yeah, they're my do's and don'ts. Well, that, that's, uh, I think those are all fantastic do's and don'ts that we can all learn from. Um, what would you say is the best way to start a prospecting call? See, I've got two angles. One is um, I, 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 I listen to a lot of these calls and many salespeople, both telesales and field sales who are making their own appointments, they start the call saying, morning, Steve, my name's Tony, blah, blah. Is now a good time to speak? And that's a no-no. I, I don't, I don't want to give you an opportunity, right, to say no immediately. So the first best way to start is change that to, glad I've caught you or thanks for taking my call. Then I'll ask a closed question. Are you familiar with the work we've done at TMI training? They might say yes. And I'll say, great, as you know, or they might say, no, I can make you aware. And then my, I guess my elevator pitch, my turn on phrase is going back to what I mentioned before. Don't talk about what you do. Talk about what you've done. So I would always want to name drop one or two companies in their space that they would know of. And I'll make sure they're the same size companies. So if I'm phoning Apple, I'm not going to talk about a, a mobile phone shop that I've helped in the high street. I'm going to talk about a similar size organization. And I'll say something like we've successfully helped as opposed to we've worked with. I'll name drop, but most importantly, I talk the result. How have I helped these companies? And then I would use what I call a takeaway phrase by saying, to see if we can help you, can I ask? And I'll ask a very well-planned open question that is aimed at the problem that I know most companies in that industry face. So if I've done my homework properly and I know that vertical, I can often come up with a very clever question that would lead them to highlight a problem or a, a pain that they face. And then I'm going to probe a lot more about it. And are there, is there anything else that you include in the beginning of a conversation with a prospect? Yeah. So I suppose an alternative route is to talk about a, a company like them that had a specific problem. And if that resonates with them. So I might say, you know what, Steve, I want to reach out to you. I followed your company with interest. And I actually work with a couple of companies in your vertical, such as A and B. 
And one thing that they've said to me, one challenge that they've really been facing is A, B, C, and D. And really the reason I want to reach out to you is how are you finding things about that in your, in your space? So I raise a problem and see how they're facing, how they're dealing with it. Does that resonate? Are they experiencing the same sort of problems? And then that normally provokes a conversation. Now, you always hear about, you know, how salespeople need to add value. How can a salesperson add value when they're reaching out to a prospect for the first time? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, the way I do it is I obviously do a mystery call, as I mentioned before I call. So to me, there's value add because I'm about to share. But also, I would always think about a couple of ideas, a couple of teasers of things you can suggest that they should be doing that they might not be. So I'll give you an example. I, in, in the UK, I work with the largest car leasing company in the country. And I also work with quite a few other companies in that space right they're a grade a client for me and i i spoke when i did a prospecting call to them i said to them my clients are converting at about 43 percent from an inquiry to a customer out of interest how does that compare to you knowing that the average conversion in that industry is about 12 percent so they said wow we're nowhere near that what are you doing and I said, well, look, let's have a meeting. That'd be the first thing I talk about. And they said, well, give me a clue, man. Can you tell me anything? So then I might drop one idea that they're doing. For example, I talk about having an email sequence set up for everyone after five contacts made and no contact, having a sequence of emails where I've written some really good subject lines that I know from experience get a response just that alone so i might share one or two ideas that would just get them thinking differently and this comes from the challenger sale right if i can challenge their status quo and give them an idea that they've not considered now i'm building value in their world and what kind of tips do you have for outside salespeople who are trying to build relationships with their prospects how can they make those relationships better and deeper so is this would you say with an existing customer as opposed to a prospect i'd say both it, both are interesting so a prospect or an existing customer so with an existing customer i i do always want to develop relationships add value so i think there's a few points number one i want to know what what things are of personal interest to my client so for example, if I know I've got a client of mine that I know is into car racing, right? He drives a Lamborghini, but I know he likes racing cars. So he very kindly referred me to someone recently and I've just booked for him and I to go on a Formula F4 racing day because I just know that would mean the world to him. So I always try and learn, I call it the nugget. I try and learn one nugget about every client, what things are important to them, and then I try where I can to do that. If I read an article that I know would be of interest to client, I would always send them an email saying the subject line, and I might send this to more than one client, but they don't know that, with the subject line, saw this, thought of you. And I would just forward them an article. Um, and, and again, I, I'm signed up to something called Harrow, help a reporter out. So it's a great way where journalists all around the world for people like, Huffington Post, uh, Forbes, are looking for great content. And I came across one last week for real estate where they were saying, I, I'm looking for a real estate expert to talk about ABC. I sent it to my 37 real estate clients, said, guys, I know you could answer this, write 200 words and you could get your, your organization into Forbes, which just adds, you know, that's a value add. It costs me nothing but it shows I'm thinking of them. And again, whenever I read a good book, I know my clients that like reading sales books, business development books. Um, so normally when I finish a copy, I'll either send my copy to them. And if it goes to more than one, I'll order it on Amazon for them. Because, you know, for a 
10 bucks, it's nothing if I can just serve them and add value. So that's what I do with my customers. With my prospects that are in the hit list, again, I try to send them white papers. I try and maybe send them a link to a webinar that I watched or a podcast that I listened to. Just saying, I know you're interested in things like this. Check this out. And I try and do that as often as I can. So I'm staying in the forefront of their minds, but I'm also showing them that I'm interested in them and I'm trying to add value to their world. Makes a ton of sense. Um, what would you say that, what are, the, what are the most important things that a salesperson can learn from a prospecting call? Uh, and, and, and should they ask prospects for feedback? Um, yeah, ever. <laughs> That's clever, actually. Um, I think there's always things to learn. And I think it was Nelson Mandela, actually, who said this. He said, you actually never lose. He said, you win and you learn. And I, I apply that concept to prospecting calls or prospecting meetings. And yes, I think there's nothing wrong in asking for feedback. But I, but I, and there's two times I do it. So if I've won the customer... I want to know why they chose me because to me, that's my USP. It's not what I think it is, it's what my clients believe it to be. So when I've won a client, I always say to them, this isn't for my ego. I just want to learn what my clients think. Why did you decide to engage me? But I equally do it when I make a prospecting call and they decide they don't want to meet me or they don't want to work with me. But what I do, and touching on what you said, Steve, I don't think the salesperson should do the call. I think their colleague should do it for them. And the reason I suggest that is then you'll get the truth. So if I ever lose a deal, one of my sales team would phone and say along the lines of, at Tony Morris International, we are striving to, the best, to be the best we can be. I know you've been engaging with Tony and he's not been successful but we always want to learn, grow and develop. Be honest with us. What was the reason you chose not to meet with Tony or chose not to engage with Tony? And they zip up and then they get the truth. And I think, you know, I've got rhino skin as most field salespeople should have. And I just want to learn. I just want to get better. But I think it's got to come from someone else. Otherwise, you just won't get the truth. Yeah, that's a great strategy. You know, if a sales manager has time, a frontline sales manager has time to do that, that's fantastic. Mm. Also fantastic to just pair, pair reps up and uh, yeah. have them gain that, that feedback. It's so hard to get truthful and honest feedback in the world. Correct. Um, and I, I would, especially if you're a field sales rep, buddy up with one of your other reps who looks after a different territory and just say, look, John, do me a favor. You do my calls and I'll do yours. And then let's share feedback. And, and if it's really bad, just break it to me gently. But, you know, it's, it's like, you know, it's the only way you're going to learn if you get the truth. And, you know, if the, if the prospect thinks you're a bit of an arse, un, most people aren't going to tell you that. They're just going to go, you know what, you're too expensive or I'm going to stick with my incumbent. And that might be genuine, but often it won't be. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Um, what would you say? Well, I guess why don't we jump into the, the, the next section, which is called sales in 60 seconds. So quick questions, quick answers. I like it. What are the biggest prospecting myths? Well, number one is prospecting doesn't work. <laughs> the only people who say that are people who are trying to sell you a solution that isn't prospecting. And the other people who are saying that don't know how to do it. And I think there's a lot of social salespeople out there that are saying prospecting doesn't work. It's also about, all about social selling and building up a tribe. Yeah, that works as well. But ultimately, whatever you're doing leads to a phone call or a Zoom appointment or a meeting. So the biggest myth to me is it doesn't work. You know, that to me is, is BS. And it just means they've not been shown the right way. Yeah, well, in my, in my life, I, but I, I feel like I've proven 10 times that it does work in 10 different situations. So it, Absolutely. It, for, it for sure works. And it's, it's, uh, it often set, 
separates those that, that, that experience success and those that don't, I think, especially, right. you know, new companies, companies that are just starting that sort of thing. Like some are able to get their ideas out there and some aren't. And, you know, it's Absolutely. great to build the tribe over time, but there, when, yeah. you, when you have a new product or a new service or in, in a lot of circumstances, new, maybe it's just new to this customer. You need to reach out directly. You gotta, you can't just cast nets. You gotta throw spears. Absolutely. Absolutely. What, what about gatekeepers? If you run into a gatekeeper, what's the best tip that you have for a sales rep, an outside sales rep that's running into a gatekeeper that's keeping them away from a decision maker? My best tip actually is treat them as a human and ask for their help. So they answer the phone, you know, good morning, um, Badger Software, Sarah speaking. Morning, Sarah. My name's Tony Morris from TMI Training. Sarah, I really hope you can help me. I, I work with a lot of companies like yours, and typically I speak to the head of sales, global sales, or sales director. Sarah, who within your organization is, would probably be accountable for developing the, the sales team within your company? And just by using her name or his name, showing a bit of an interest, and asking for help, most times gatekeepers are actually quite comfortable with that. I think so many people try and get past the gatekeeper and by doing so are almost quite rude, patronizing, and it gets the gatekeepers back up. So the last thing they want to do is help you. So I think turn that on its head and ask for help. Makes sense. And if you only had one minute with a prospect, what would you say? What, what are the key messages that you're trying to get across? I would say to that prospect, um, hopefully if it's the right prospect for me, they're in my hit list, I would tell them a success story. I say that my organization, we have successfully helped people like you, such as A, B, and C. And the way we've done that is we've actually increased their conversion from an inquiry to a customer by in some cases over 32%, whilst increasing the average order value. Now, Mr. Prospect, I have no idea if I can achieve the same with you, but I just want to ask you a few questions just to see if I believe I can help. And after that, those questions, if I can't, I'm going to be honest with you. But if I can, I think that that should lead to another conversation. What would you say some common mistakes are that you see reps make in their conversations with their prospects? They do what I call the sales puke and they start talking at them for about four minutes and all about them. Mr. Prospect, let me tell you about my company. The prospect doesn't care. Let me tell you about the award we won in 2008. Let me tell you about my founder, and how great he is and why he set my company up. And they bore the socks off the prospect and it's all about them. The prospect, the only person the prospect cares about is themselves. And as long as you can articulate how you can help that prospect either solve a pain or achieve a goal, they don't care about anything else. So use that prospect's name and talk, about, talk their language and about them Talk about results, don't talk about your company. And what would you say the number one key is to differentiating yourself from your competitors? So this is a tough one because it depends, look, it depends what industry you're in. I think the truth is we all think we know what our differentiators are, but the best way to really know is ask your customers why they chose you. And I used to call this my USP, my unique selling point. But again, I think that's quite selfish because that's about you. You know, what's our unique selling point as in what can we say to sell? But it's never about you. It's about your customer. So I believe it should be called a UCB, your unique customer benefit. What do you offer? What do you deliver? What do you provide that's unique in the marketplace but more importantly, it's a benefit to your clients that you're serving. And the, and the true, I think I can guess what it is in my company, but I'd rather hear it from my customer's mouth. They, 
especially if they've met my competitors, they'll know better than me what they believe is a unique benefit to them. So I would say my best advice, ask your customers who who've you served for many years. And as an actionable takeaway, what should the field salespeople listening today do as a first step to getting started on highly effective sales prospecting? Look, they've got to invest in themselves as, as an actionable tip immediately. I think there's two things. Number one, choose your lane. So many times I say to a field rep, who do you work with? Who's your, your right customer? And they say to me, everyone. My product is right for everyone. So I play a bit with them and I go, so my son, Harry, he's 12. Is it right for Harry? Oh, no, 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 no. It wouldn't be right for Harry. So then it's not everyone, is it? And they go, well, it's not everyone. I say, well, my daughter, Poppy, she's nine. Is it good for Poppy? No, uh, it's not good for Poppy. So I've just given you two people and you've just said it's not right for them. So choose your lane. Is it for a male or a female? Is it what, what age are we talking about? What industry are they in? What size of organization are they in? What's their turnover? Have an idea of your lane and stick to it. And I, and I think the other thing is field salespeople by nature of their job have a lot of time on the road. Use that time wisely. I remember when I was out in the field, my, my, my car was my office. So when I was driving, I would always phone clients because I didn't need to write anything down. That was my time to catch up, build rapport, develop my relationship. But also it was my time to learn. And I would listen to audio books every single day, like two hours a day. And what I would do is I'd have a quick voice on my iPhone. And as soon as I heard a nugget, something that could serve me or my clients, I would turn off my stereo and speak into my phone on a quick voice. So when I got back to the hotel that I was staying at, I'd type up those notes in what I call my sales Bible. So I never wasted a minute. I used that time to learn or to continue developing the relationships with my clients. Yeah, I, I do something similar. I use just a Google Doc on my phone and I'll just open it up and, and take notes into it like speech to text right in, right into the doc so there's not you know it just all happens in real time very helpful um Absolutely. and yeah that, using your using your car as as an office and and using that time wisely and and, uh, and and frankly most of the people who listen to this podcast we've gotten feedback from them that they're listening to it when they're on the road in between yeah. meetings so i i think a lot of the people who who are listening here are already you know, the types of people that are, are interested in sharpening the sword and developing their, their skills. But the only thing I'd say to that is, yes, they're, they are learning and they're hopefully their knowledge levels are going up, but they say knowledge is power, not if you don't use it. So are they actually learning and reading what they've written? Are they actually actioning it and implementing it and seeing results? And are they tweaking it? till they get the outcome they deserve. And, you know, having helped 30,000 salespeople, vast majority, they, they say they like to learn, but they don't take action, a lot of people. And I don't know why that is, because that's just not how I think and operate, but there's a lot of people out there, unfortunately, that listen and learn, but don't do much with it. So I think the takeaway is take action and actually do something to, to, to get different results to what you currently get. Absolutely. Well, I'm going to try to summarize all this uh, really very valuable stuff you've told us today. Um, so first point that Tony made, salespeople can build an effective prospecting mindset by truly believing they can help their prospects solve problems or help them achieve their goals. Look at your history to understand who are the best prospects for you? Who is your ideal customer profile? Break down your customers into A, B, C, D categories to find your best kind of prospect. Um, reactively, if, you know, if you're just reacting to inbound leads, et cetera, you'll get prospects who are in the A through the D categories. But if you're proactive, you're gonna be able to spend your time going after a lot more A's. 
So to find a way to start a conversation with a prospect, figure out your trigger events. That means setting up Google alerts for companies that are your ideal customer profile and use the information in these alerts to start your conversation. When you, re when you reach out, uh, try talking about what you've done successfully for customers, for companies, existing customers for you, companies like them that you can name drop. Uh, another trick that Tony gave us was to consider reaching out with a short video message when you're prospecting using a tool like BombBomb or uh, I think it's Loom or mm. Vidyard. Um, once a prospect opens up your email, follow up with a phone call. Uh, once they open up and watch that video email, uh, you'll be able to see it and track it and, and so follow up then. Uh, before you call a prospect, do your research, check out their LinkedIn, read any articles they've written, and prepare for the call so that you can provide value. To provide value during a prospecting call, prepare a few ideas that can get your prospect thinking differently and allow them to challenge the status quo. To build relationships with prospects or customers, try taking time to learn about their interests and send them resources that will be really useful or interesting for them. Finally, ask your prospects for feedback. When you win, ask why they decided to work with you. When you lose, ask a colleague to call and talk to the prospect about why you lost and have them ask why they decided not to engage with you. This has been such valuable information, Tony. Where, where can our listeners read more about your work? How do they reach out to you? Well, thank you. I've got to say that was a great summary. I was really impressed. Like, <laughs> I, was, I was learning there. I was thinking, they have good ideas. You're like, did I say that? That sounds yeah. great. <laughs> I, I didn't realize I was that good. Um, <laughs> You're great, the, man. <laughs> the, yeah. The best place is probably like I'm on all the social media platforms, right? LinkedIn, Facebook, Insta. Um, I, I would suggest go to my website, TonyMorrisInternational.com. Um, you can contact me there. And for any of your listeners that do listen to, you know, read books, read sales books, I've written five books, and I'll be delighted if they ping me an email, which is Tony at TonyMorrisInternational.com. With pleasure, I'll send them a, a copy of my ebook at no cost to them. Um, my best-selling sales book was Coffees for Closers. I, I got published that eight years ago now and that was an amazon bestseller for telemarketing so with pleasure for any of your guests steve i'll be delighted to give them a they ping me an email with the subject line book uh, i'll be delighted to send them a copy and uh, and if they want to learn and grow and truly develop themselves i i'm launching a platform called tmi sales university which has got over 300 videos all bite-sized three-minute videos split across 30 modules, all about helping telephone and field sales reps thrive. And that's what the university is all about. It's a monthly business, a subscription model that will, will really help salespeople if they're genuinely serious about achieving the best results in their career. So uh, yeah, if they're interested, I can send them some details about that as well. Very cool. We'll get that all in the show notes here so that people can reach out to those resources. This has been a, uh, another great episode of the Outside Sales Talk. If anyone can think of other sales reps who would benefit from what Tony's saying about prospecting, uh, please forward this on to, uh, to that person. And uh, if you find these helpful, please uh, leave a rating for the podcast. That, that's super helpful as well. Take care until next time, everybody.